So I think one of the things I'm so impressed about SNE is the fact that when you guys practice in clinic, but at the same time, you guys talk about a lot of research and what kind of problems that we want to solve. So the, 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 the culture of being tying clinician side and also being a scientist is very, um, is very diverse at the same time. It's quite attractive to people going to SNE or Singapore to work because you are doing transformative work, as you said. So from being a clinician scientist to now as SCR director, and you talk about like you can foresee what are the development in ophthalmology in the say five to 10 years. So what are the predictions or what kind of thing you are foreseeing is going to happen in the field of ophthalmology? Um, okay. So I think that, I mean, if you, if you look at the, the big, the big areas of breakdown, mm. I mean, I don't want to disrespect certain subspecialities, but I think that the big areas mm. are going to basically be in, in retina, in mm. cornea and glaucoma. I mean, they, they are the largest uh, subspecialities anyway and stuff as well, right? So I think that those are going to basically be the largest areas where you're going to see things. I mean, overwhelmingly, even this morning when I was driving into work here, um, you know, there was a lot of conversation. There's got a big debate in the UK about the safety of basically AI. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about um, AI being used for certain things and how um, they're able to record people's voices and then basically regenerate information there. And obviously with chat GPT coming on as yeah. well, we're just giving people's advice. So it's it's gonna come. I think there's it's it's already you know in certain areas, mm -hmm. um, and I obviously I think it's gonna get better. I mean with GPT four and stuff and things, it's gonna get or chat four point zero is gonna get better than that it's gonna than it is already uh, currently as well. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna happen. Um, people have this fear it's gonna take their job away from them, yeah. right? In uh, you know in some sort of way. I don't think that's I don't think that's gonna happen. But it may you have to alter. Maybe you'll alter the job. But you have to realize that. You see, is that also in the fact that it, it, with an aging population, so your population getting older, mm -hmm. we all know that basically if you look at the amount of medication and and um, care you need mm -hmm. for an older person, it's much higher than it is for a younger person. Everybody basically right. knows that, right? The answer is never to train more doctors. I can tell you that now. Oh, That's okay. never the answer, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to use skill sets or upscale skill sets at a level or make something simpler to basically increase the use, right? Or increase the availability. And I think that's what AI does in its way, basically in diagnostics, in basically doing, it's it's like it's like the revolution. Or, you know, if you look at these, you know, you watch these movies from like the forties of uh, so factory workers doing very mm. mundane stuff, like yeah, uh, like making things up. And now it's all done there. You see those, you know, people putting cars yeah. and stuff, right? And now you saw those robots putting the car, yeah, it's the same to me it's the same as that right so you, mm -hmm. now the robots do it and they can robots can run 24 7 and years ago in the in the in the 30s and 40s this was done basically manually by maybe seven people mm -hmm. right now what happened to those seven people sure so probably over time those jobs got phased out and stuff but those people then will go into different skill set jobs maybe designing the robot understanding how it works and stuff mm -hmm. or can coordinate so there will be different jobs that will open up in relation to technology that will then be basically available and stuff. So you will have that time where it will shift. I don't think AI is going to be taking the jobs away, but I think that it will be additive assisted to try to be able to streamline some of the things from there itself. But it goes to the principle of trying to simplify something down at a level and making more people, giving access more people to standard of care that we would expect in any developed country. And, and that's why I think certain countries like certain continents, say, say even Africa, even large countries like mm -hmm. India, China, where parts of the country may be more rural, um, it would allow the rural population to have access to technology that you may only see in an urban population as well. And I think mm -hmm. that's where we have to try to think about this at a from a global scale. So that would be basically with AI. I see the same thing basically with cell therapy for cornea. It's not that your outcomes are gonna be better than if you do a DMEC, but you know, the result, not so many people still do DMEC. Only 30% of rates, in the, even in the US, are basically DMEC and stuff. But cell therapy simplifies the surgery down to a mm -hmm. procedure. It's de-skilled to a procedure that, you know, a second-year resident could do, basically. And mm -hmm. by de-skilling something down, of course, if you think of it from a, you know, a bigger population, yeah. yeah, more people are going to benefit. Now, I know there's still issues with delivery and getting financial support mm -hmm. and getting the cells. I understand that. And I, and I think those things... Uh, are tackleable and stuff as well. But by de-skilling the procedure, what you've done is, is that you don't need a fellowship trained corneal surgeon for which right. in the biggest scheme of things in the world, there are not so many to do a procedure that could take five minutes that could be done by any first year resident. And 
So being able to de-skill that will suddenly allow a lot more people access to a technology and stuff as well. And I think, again, that's another example of where I see this thing going going down eventually to allow people to have more access from there itself. I mean, glaucoma has also changed a lot in the fact that I think in the past with complicated glaucoma surgery, you saw you saw it as a very self-specialist field. Now, medication has changed glaucoma a, a lot because they get much better IOP control, right? Now with just medication things itself. And now you see all these different MIGs or minimum invasive uh, glaucoma devices and things like that. And that seems to be something that's spilled over to the realm from the glaucoma surgeon, even into the general ophthalmologist and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like general ophthalmology and maybe an interesting glaucoma or general ophthalmology plus or something where, again, it's allowed in most... Uh, general ophthalmologists would never do a glaucoma tube, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe the colectomies wouldn't be so good either. But a lot of them probably will do mix and stuff because it's a much more minimally invasive surgery and stuff. Now, mm -hmm. would that, in, in, in the bigger scheme of things, would that mean people have better pressure control? Maybe. And maybe they'll be more compliant to basically going away from using topical drops and stuff. And I think that tackling those problems um, actually will but uh, will increase access and al allow people to be much more compliant with their medication. There's there's some new IOLs that, I, I mean, is undergoing phase, I think phase one, phase two trials in the United States that are very interesting where they put drug elution on the lens. So you have a standard cataract operation and it's got a little thing on the haptic that's eluting a, a drug continually mm -hmm. after the surgery itself. Now, you can imagine that once it's basically got approved for one drug, you could think about a whole host of yeah, and yeah. the common medications up and you can imagine, can imagine you'll get 24 seven out 24 seven control of your IOP, which is, yeah. you know, you see many patients in clinic compliance rates. If you're lucky, <laughs> yeah. probably, you know, uh, and, you, and some of them are taking like three drops a day. Can you believe yeah. it? Right. And you know, that compliance is going to be a huge issue. And so, yeah. so, so, and I think that to, again, you, you can see how through innovation, you're improving people's outcomes. Um, by actually solving a clinical need problem that we all see every day, which is a compliance drop mm -hmm. issue and stuff as well. And that's the, and I think that's what's going to basically improve. And, and, and I think it will have a direct effect. Obviously, this will need to be proved for research, but it'll have a direct effect on outcomes, but surely because you're getting better IOP control. Mm. So I think it's quite refreshing from a ophthalmology, even from a doctor perspective, to think that AI or technology is not a threat, but it's an opportunity. And that yeah. from the high cutting edge technology trickle down towards a general perspective and allowing more people to practice and helping more people. It's a very refreshing perspective from like a doctor perspective. So on that note, actually, I want to ask more about like from DMAC and also for some of our viewers may not know what DMAC is. So can you explain more about it and why is it kind of transforming from PK to DMAC? What was, why is it so important right now? Yeah. 